What's the deal with prescribing temazepam as part of oral sedation or pre-sedation? Are there any concerns about giving this to your patients or maybe sometimes the doctor, the general practitioner has given this to your patients? And what about deciding whether inhalation sedation, aka gas and air, versus intravenous sedation is best for your patient? And what is the correct path you have to take to be able to safely provide sedation in practice? These are all the questions we'll be covering in today's episode. Hello, Patrice Rati. I'm Jazz Galati, and welcome back to your favorite dental podcast. It's not often we do an episode on sedation. It's quite a niche thing, but it complements some of the previous episodes we've done, such as the one about hypnosis with Mike Gao. You have to listen to that one. And Mike and Roy, today's guests, are actually really good friends. And it makes total sense. You know, Roy was a fantastic, calm, communicator, I would feel very safe in his hands as a patient. And that's what we all want. We all want our patients to feel safe around us. And that comes from how we communicate to our patients. So before we start on this episode about sedation, all those things that I just discussed, let's get to the protrusive dental pearl. So if you're new to the podcast, every main episode, every PDP episode, I will share a protrusive dental pearl. One tip that you can apply straight away. And this one is about communication. I very often like to do a communication one. And this is not because I am some sort of master of communication. This is far from it. This is just something that I've been very much in tune with myself. I try to reflect on my communication skills and try to improve. And I try to look at other clinicians when I shadow them or when I see them in practice. What can I learn from them? So the example I'm going to share with you today is I had a dentist shadowing me recently. And I like to ask dentists, what did you learn today? What did you gain from today? And she said to me, Jazz, I like the way that when you were explaining risks to a patient, you just slowed down. You just really slowed the pace down and emphasized certain words. And through doing that, I think you are a more impactful communicator and patients will remember. And I'm very intentional when I do this. In fact, after a deep restoration or a really nasty crack and I take a photo with my intro or camera and after the procedure, I'll sit the patient up and I'll say, wow, that was really tough, Mrs. Smith, or, or make some sort of comment. And I'll also compliment them and well done, you stayed open really well and I appreciate your how still you were or something like that. And then I'll say, I'm happy with how everything went, but you do have quite a nasty crack in there. I'm hoping that your nerve will survive and you won't need something called a root canal treatment. But in case you do, here are the things that you're looking out for. I want you to get in touch with me if you get a severe throbbing ache, any sleep disturbance due to toothache, or just sensitivity that doesn't settle. And of course, I'll show them on the big screen the photo of their crack. And now the patient has owned their problem. It's their crack. I'm just the communicator. I'm just passing on this message. I'm just showing them what I found in their tooth. And I know that in the 99% chance that they're not going to have any issues, they'll think, wow, you know, um, this is amazing. Jazz is a great dentist. I didn't get any of that horrible pain that you described. But equally, if they do get you know, irreversible pitis or get into trouble from this tooth because of the crack, they'll remember that part of the episode. In fact, it takes me back to a really good episode we did, which is called Consent is Like an Onion with Sean Sellers and Zach Cara. Do listen to that one because Sean uh, summarized something called the peak end rule. What parts of the consultation do patients remember? What parts of an appointment do patients remember? And they remember the peak, the most significant thing of that appointment and the end. So if you end on a high and if you're nice and calm in your approach and you slow down and emphasize and be a visual educator to the patient, you show them the crack, for example, in this example I'm sharing with you, then I think that's a really good way to communicate risks to your patient. Now, let's join Dr. Roy Bennett to talk about sedation for the wet fingered practitioner. Dr. Roy Thanks. Bennett, welcome to the Protrusive Dental Podcast, my friend. How are you? Yeah, really good. Thanks. How are you? Yeah, great. And it's, it's great yeah, to have yeah. a rare sedation speaker. It's not something we've covered that well on the podcast or in that much depth. So I want to cover it in a way yeah. that's going to, those burning questions that we have around the world as dentistry, as, as I do believe, and I'm sure you've seen as trends, and we'll talk about it, is that the use of sedation uh, is perhaps underutilized in, in various countries, and it's only going to go higher and higher. But you're the expert in that. For those who are unfamiliar with you, Roy, please tell us a little bit about yourself as a practicing dentist and yourself as a sedationist. Okay, so I've been in practice about 34 years now. I've spent about 15 years of those in special care dentistry at the university background. And then I set up my own teaching facility back in 2011 to teach postgraduates around the country sedation. Because as you said, there's an absolute need for that. And I teach IV sedation. Okay, so I actually do a little bit of oral sedation, a bit of inhalation sedation, 
And also I'm quite a holistic practitioner, so I do off hypnotherapy as well. Brilliant. So quite a well-rounded sort of sedationist, if you like. You showed me some videos of someone who I believe, for some reason, you couldn't use IV sedation, but then you were using hypnotherapy, and you showed me how relaxed that patient was. And so that was really cool to see. So I'm sure we can, even for those practitioners who aren't using drugs of any sort or gases of any sort to sedate, there are some things that we can perhaps share to help put their yeah. patients at ease a bit more. So I'm very excited for today's chat. And so it's great to hear you've been yeah. teaching dentists about this kind of stuff. So I'm going to start with my basic level question before we then escalate to IV and whatnot is oral sedation. A lot of my patients in the past have obtained temazepam, like oral, from their GP prior to the appointment with me. And that made me feel awkward because I was a little bit uncertain about where that puts me in terms of, okay, a patient is technically under sedation. I'm not sedation trained. How could something go wrong? So I want to know from you, medical legally, what are the rules and the laws in terms of me being able to, A, give out temazepam, and then Mm -hmm. what level of training do I need or or what are the requirements? And B, that goes along with that, what if the GP gives temazepam? Am I in st- still some way responsible for the sedation during the dentistry? Interesting, isn't it? Okay, okay. So, so let's go back to basics. Basically, the temazepam is a benzodiazepine, right? It's one of the family of the drugs, quite traditional. In the sedation world that I work in, you know, things like temazepam is a pre-medicant. So it's pre-medication. It just takes the edge off people when they're slightly anxious, okay? Now, I prefer my patient to be open with me. Um, as they've been with you to let you know that they've taken that. But one thing you've got to know about that is, one thing you've got to know is that your consent process then is not valid. If you want to change a treatment plan when a patient on temazepam, then you have to go back to when they're not on temazepam. So you can't then launch into a different treatment profile once they're slightly sedated. If we're doing sedation on site, we wouldn't give temazepam, we'd use oral sedation. So to me, temazepam, to be clear, or diazepam given by a GP or prescribed by you would be just to take the edges off somebody. It's just to relieve the pre-treatment anxiety. And do you think it's a useful thing to... You're not a fan, okay, just coming on to that. No, I think think it's an adjunct. I think if you've got somebody who's particularly anxious, sometimes they'll double up on the dose. They may take alcohol with that. You're not in control. And I'm a guy in sedations like to be in control. So when you take a pre medic you're sort of fixed in third gear. You, you can't go through the gears, you can't titrate the drug. The temazepam is a one fixed dose, as it were. And then it's also dependent on what they've eaten, how they've slept, what their demeanor is. So it's a lot of clinicians will use this, but I'm not a fan because you're not in control you're not controlling the sedation. Uh, so medical legally, I'm not a fan, I have to say. Okay, that's it's useful place. to know. It has its place to give the patient a reasonable night's sleep the night before. But to be honest, when you get a very anxious, it's not going to hit the side. That controllability is not. So it's not enough to, no, no. it's not enough of an anxiolytic, it sounds like. And also it does mess up your consent process. So for those listening who yeah. do have a patient who didn't know it was taking temazepam and they come to you and say, I just, you know, I was so nervous. My GP gave me temazepam and they're kind of drugged up in your practice. Then a great point made by Roy that actually you've got to be really careful about changing the course mm-hmm. of treatment. And also if you go outside the remit of what a GP does, which is usually about, you know, two to five milligrams of diazepam or 10 to 20 milligrams of temazepam, you're really straying into more high sedation levels. So pre-medication before the procedure or going to sleep, quite low doses. So really those low doses are just going to just take the edge off people. If they're really angry when they come in to see you, that anxiety will still be there in some way. So you might be disappointed as a clinician that hasn't done what you thought it would do. Okay, you've done a good job of putting me off to mazepam. What is the the level one? So, you know, what is the next level up from that that you think that GDPs who may be entering the world of sedation could start Mm -hmm. to do that you feel has its place more widespread in clinical dentistry? So one of the important things is to assess the patient correctly. So I use pre-visit questionnaire, which I send out to the home address. They fill that in. I get a level of the anxiety that they have through the modified dental anxiety score. We get a score, which is more valid. And then I can work out 
what kind of approach that we're going to do with that patient. Now, it might be uh, inhalation sedation. It might be a little bit of hypnotherapy. It might be the language you use with the patient. We're going to put topical on. We're going to, we're going to look after you. It's the language that's really important. It's a bit like NLP language, okay? So we don't use the words, obviously, pain, injection, excavator. We talk about things like comfort, how comfortable you are. We'll put cream on. That will make you feel more comfortable. And then we'll present the treatment plan and decide which route we take the patient down, whether that's inhalation sedation or just sort of in a neuralistic programming, you like. Or we'll go down the IV sedation route. Okay, so it sounds like really in terms of lowest anxiety to highest anxiety, like level one, we're talking just really good care in terms of communication and being selective of your words and creating a nice calming environment. One level up from that, which might need a bit more investment in the practice. We'll talk about scavenging and stuff like inhalation sedation. The level up from that would be intravenous. Are those all of those that are used in general practice by general dentists or are there any others? Well, you could use uh, intranasal sedation if somebody is quite phobic. And you could use some oral sedation, which is on-site sedation, not outside the practice where they take a tablet. So they come into the practice and then you would mix an elixir or a drink of benzodiazepine, midazolam, and that would then calm the patient. Now, if you're going to go down that route of them having a drink of oral sedation, then they do need to be cannulated. So you've got to have the know-how and the core of knowledge to be a IV sedationist to give oral sedation. Does that make sense? It does. And is it a myth that inhalation sedation is just for children? Correct. Absolute. So I'll do a myth bust here for you. Please. So basically, it's I do inhalation sedation right from sort of five-year-olds right up to 95-year-olds. Okay, it's a really, really good system. It's a really safe system because when we do inhalation sedation, we've always got we've always got 30% oxygen flowing through in that background, which is even better than the 21% air that we breathe, isn't it? So very safe system, titratable. So you can go up and down, as with IV sedation, which is what I like. It's titratable. We can dose it to the end point and the reaction of the patient. So I'm going through my gears, going through the inhalation sedation of percentage of the drug, the sedative of nitrous oxide that we would give. So you're very safe, underused in the UK. 50% of American GDPs use it. In wow. The States, okay, which is amazing, isn't it? When you, go, when you visit the States, you'll notice every practice or every other practice has an inhalation sedation unit. And why is that? Because the public expect it. They expect that kind of level of option or care when they need the treatment, okay? So it's, a, it's an expectation of the American public. So inhalation sedation, absolutely underused in the UK. It shouldn't just be used in community care or special care. So it's, it's a really good thing. Sometimes I don't want to sedate an elderly patient or they're on certain medicines. We'll just use a little bit of inhalation sedation to take that impression. Like if we're not doing a digital scan, whatever, or they're just a little bit phobic. It's limitations, if you like, are probably where the patient is extremely phobic or extremely anxious. And then the inhalation sedation, the nitrous won't be enough. Mm -hmm. to get them from A to B. So we really do have to go back to what I said at the start, which is to be, let's assess this correctly. Where does that patient lie in their anxiety score? I'm going to ask you a tough question now, Roy. Assuming all Mm. things being equal with a patient, patient A and patient B, that their medical history is that they're ASA grade one, fit and healthy, but they're slightly different in the anxiety levels in in terms of MDAS. Is there a magic score? in terms of, okay, after 21, I consider inhalation sedation not to be effective. Is there a magic score or is it still an art form? Is it still arts and crafts? Yes. Yeah, it's a good question. Um, Sedation is an art form. It's bringing the science together with your personality and the demeanor and the personality of the patient as well. So absolutely, as we always said, in any kind of sphere of dentistry, whether it's implant dentistry or whatever, there is an art form to this. It's that discussion, which is pre-sedation discussion with the patient, which is critical. So I'll always book 20 minutes. I'll sit down with the patient, not in the dental chair. We'll sit together, we'll go through it, and we'll find out what ticks the box for that patient. Where do they lie? Because some patients who are control type patients, type A behavior, probably might resist the sedation. And it might Mm -hmm. be a bit of a sedation failure for you. So we have to see, the patient has to trust you, and they have to be on board. 
with the sedation. We're not going to do the sedation at the patient because we're ticking an MDAS score. We need the patient to follow us on that journey as well. Got it. So there's no, yeah, I mean, I expected that to be honest. I know there's no magic answer, magic number. Yeah. In terms of the level of training medical legally required, and if you know about the US and Australia, because we've got lots of listeners from US, Australia, New Zealand, around the world, but obviously yeah, I'm yeah. sure you know about the UK, but if you know about the world as well, it'd be great to know from you. What is the level of training that you need to be able to provide inhalation okay. sedation in practice? Okay, so you need to basically do a core of knowledge over one or two days, like the 12 hours CPD, which is didactic teaching. And then you've got to be supervised through your 10 cases of mixed variety inhalation sedation. If, if you're going to do that, then you would do some assessments as well. So you'll have a supervised colleague standing next to you, and then they'll go through the 10 cases. So you might take one or two or three days to do that if you've got all your cases together or over a matter of weeks or months. And then you will, re, will revisit those cases and discuss that with your supervisor. So IV sedation a little bit more in depth, again, a two day beginner course core knowledge. And then we need to do 20 courses, uh, 20, 20 cases, cases okay? yeah. 20 cases, 20 cases of mixed ability again. So from extractions, fillings or whatever. Okay. So you do that need, you do need that 20 cases. Now that just gives you a basic sort of understanding in my view, then you really start learning as, as all things in dentistry, you start, you have some failures, you have to accept that. You have to revisit that. So, but basically it's the IACD, the Intercollegiate Advisory Committee of Sedation and Dentistry, 2015, revised 2020. The standards, and that's what we follow and what the lawyers follow, is 20 cases, logged cases. Mm -hmm. Now, when you carry on as a sedationist, you must keep your log cases, the log book, in case the CQC ever decide to walk in and say, oh, tell me about your sedation cases. Oh, that would just make sense. Okay. So that fine. That's a lovely, nice, clear guidelines to follow. In terms of being able to implement this, I remember doing some restorative cases, and then I essentially I hired a sedationist to come to just manage the sedation because I had too much on my plate. I was raising the vertical okay. dimension. It was my early days. I was still very much engrossed in my restorative dentistry. There's no way I could expect to do anything beyond what I was doing in the mouth. Now I'm at a point where I'm a lot more comfortable with my restorative dentistry. Could I? Is it naughty if I'm doing the restorative dentistry? and the sedation at the same time? Or should there be someone else doing the sedation always? How does that work? Okay, okay. so my, my philosophy is, if it's a straightforward thing that you're doing in dentistry, if it's a simple thing, if it's a straightforward extraction, if it's straightforward restorative, if your head space is not too overused, as it were, then go ahead and be the operator sedationist. And that's the term you're, that you were mentioning there, operator sedationist. Now. If it's not simple and it's not straightforward or the patient is challenging or the patient has some medical comorbidities or the general situation is a bit more stressful for you as the operator, then I'd always get a dedicated sedationist in. Got it. Okay. And that's what the standards say, actually. If things are a bit more challenging, step back. Take two steps back. Well, I'm going to concentrate on my occlusion today, on the restorative. I'll be placing the implants. My head's going to be pretty full and this patient's a bit challenging, actually. So do you know what? I'm going to have a good team member with me. I'm going to have a dedicated sedationist in who's going to take that pressure off. And also that's best care for the patient as well, because we need a dedicated sedationist at the other end of the chair who's just going to monitor the patient, look after the patient while you can do your excellent dentistry. Brilliant. Now, if we, dentists start thinking about sedation training, and let's say they get some cases under their belt, they build their portfolio, they get their mm. 20 cases. And we'll talk about at the end about how to go about doing that. I'm sure you have a great help that you yeah, can yeah. give us all. When dentists, maybe your delegates or dentists that you've trained run in trouble, because everything's got some failures, just like you said, you know, we get failures, I get restorative failures, you get sedation failures and that kind of stuff. What are the most common lessons to be learned for those starting in sedation that you could share with us? Okay. So I think the first hurdle that most people sort of have to leap over, if you like, is on their first few cases when they are giving the drug, okay? So giving the drug is, is via a cannula, obviously, in the back of the hand or in the arm. And actually, cannulation skills is a big hurdle for most people. So it's a learned skill, a bit like when we're trying to find a you know, second MV canal and a molar. It's, all, it's a learned technique, okay? So cannulation, the more we do, the more we learn the better we become. So that's a little bit of a hurdle. Second hurdle, 
that we come across is we administer the drug under supervision with our colleague, but then we say to our colleague, when do you think I should start to numb the patient up? When, when do you think the patient's ready? And that's where the art form comes and looking at the patient and saying, right, I'm going to say to the patient now, are you okay if we numb you up now? Are you ready to proceed? And the patient may go, oh, yeah, nod or nod. And we know we're at the right level of sedation then. What we don't want to do is jump the situation and the patient be under sedated and then start numbing the patient up. And that can dissipate the good effect that we've achieved already. So it's the timing, the timing of numbing up timing of administration of the drug so that takes a learning curve of sort of five to ten cases to see that and it's turning that knowledge into that. wisdom isn't it really roy yeah absolutely and, and then keeping that patient you've taken the patient to a nice level of sedation and as, as i say cruising altitude we want to keep the patient nicely comfortable and it might be a long procedure it might be two three four hours implants Gomas, whatever. So we want to maintain that patient at a nice level of sedation. Let the patient land and become to a nice recovery and a safe discharge. So it's like well, taking that patient on a sedation journey. One question I've got already, Roy, because you've sparked my interest now, is yeah. I had this another myth busting, let's call it then, a misconception that I had. But previously when I asked you about inhalation sedation for adults, that was a previous myth that I had that was corrected. And me and Mike Gow many episodes ago discussed that and we confirmed that. So if yeah. you guys haven't listened to that Mike Gow episode, it's brilliant. Roy, you and Mike are yeah. good friends as well. So that is nice to hear. Uh, hello, Mike, okay. if you're listening. And so another misconception I had with sedation is that you have the, I don't know where I read this, but like the golden hour the golden 45 minutes once you start IV sedation okay. you've got to get everything done in 45 minutes and I actually remember doing my restorative cases being like okay I've got 45 minutes prep 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 oh, so, so you've actually <laughs> just busted that myth so what is the truth there how can we how long can you safely go for okay, okay. so if we think about the drug that we're using that can have an effect so if we're using the basic drug that we use in the UK which is midazolam currently okay a benzodiazepine then and we titrate to effect and we get the patient in the first sort of three or four minutes at the right level of sedation, we probably, and I agree with you, we've probably got a window of about 30 to 45 minutes of peak sedation, okay? If we want to extend that, then we need to have a bit of experience and then we need to, I don't like the word topping up, but we need to add some more midazolam after about 30 minutes, okay? So we're topping up. We're topping up. But what we have to understand is that that patient's going to have a longer recovery then mm -hmm. because we've added more drug than what we started with. Okay. So now the drug profile is changing. Some of the things that we have to think about is that is how long can I keep the patient titrated at that level? Okay. Now, some clinicians will use maybe a different drug that, said that we can touch on, but which is appearing in the UK, which will give you that top up level uh, continually. Okay. So there's different drugs out there and there's anesthetists that use different drugs like propofol and that's the continuous infusion which sort of gets around this problem of the drop off after 30 or 40 minutes but that's advanced sedation got it now we'll talk about this new drug because i see you're doing lots of lecturing about it so it's worth touching on at the end in terms of some nitty-gritty details and making it tangible for dentists what this podcast is all about is when dentists yeah. are starting out implementing sedation in their practice what are the hurdles that they have to jump through like i'm thinking it's such a useful thing and i'm thinking already like in my practice we don't have anyone that provides sedation and we always have to reach out to someone so i think it'll just make <coughs> business business sense and also how much more we can serve our patients if every practice had one dentist who was trained in sedation so what are the hurdles like one automatic one i'm thinking of roy is that perhaps our nurses then also need to be sedation trained is that a, a, a hurdle yeah uh, uh that's, that's correct. So there, there are two routes you can go down in the practice. One is that you've just mentioned, you've touched on, which is you bring in a dedicated sedationist and that sort of complies with all the regulations and the standards. They would be purely administering the drug and monitoring the patient. So it would be nice for your team to have some core of knowledge, but it's not absolutely required. So that dedicated sedationist will take all of that sort of paperwork and sort of administration off you, okay? But the other route is that you actually become the operator of sedationist and, and treat some of your patients. And yes, you would need to have a dedicated nurse who you pick out of your team who you think would be suitable to become the monitoring dedicated sedation nurse. And she would need exactly the same 20 cases, core of knowledge, 
and that's what you need. So you need a you need. I tend to have my if I'm doing operating sedationist in my practice, I'm having me as a clinician treating, and then I'm having my sedate uh, sedation nurse who does all the monitoring dedicated, and then I'll have my four-handed nurse next to me. So I have a good three-member team, okay? Got it. So the minimum is having an operator sedationist and a dedicated sedation nurse, but that then stresses because you haven't got your four-handed nurse as well. So I always say have three in the room if you're the operator sedationist. That's a good rule, actually. Yeah, rule of three. I like it. Yeah. It's also the same in crown lengthening. Rule yeah. of three, but that's another time to to tackle. <laughs> Roy, is there a yeah. ideal personality trait or an ideal type of dentist that lends himself to being a operator stationist or doing station training? Like me personally, I love the idea because I like getting people out of pain. I like making them feel at ease. I like to learn new tips or people like from people like you to make my dentistry a calmer experience. So I love all that. But equally. Yeah. I am like when I'm doing my dentistry, I am like in seven and a half magnification. I am so engrossed on every enamel prism and every retraction cord and I'm loving it. All right. Yeah. That, that I worry about then splitting my attention to, to something else. So is there an ideal candidate? So I think, well, let me take you back in time. The reason I got into sedation was because a little bit of self-preservation. Really. I'm quite an empathetic guy, but in life, you've only got so much petrol in the tank and you can only be so empathetic and that can if you're being caring individual you need sort of systems in your practice you need, you need a drugs team around you you need, you need and you <laughs> well not always drugs but, but it's useful to have isn't it so yeah so i just needed a toolkit in my bag to sort of approach these very anxious patients that would find me to get referred from colleagues, go and see roy bennett you know we don't want to do this sedation case you know, roy you can use sort it's of a great stuff. practice so, builder but absolutely, and we became a referral hub for doing the cases that nobody really wanted to do. So I had to build a very experienced team around me. So it's not just me, it's my visiting anaesthetist, it's my sedation nurses that I've trained over the years, it's the receptionist. Everybody in the team is really important. It's a holistic thing. It's a whole team that's important in giving that patient that journey from being very phobic to being accepting the treatment, okay? So my mission really is to take them off the drugs, is not to be a, a sedation dentist. It might be for the first few appointments, but if I follow the standards, it's doing the simple way, simple things for patients. So it might be to wean a IV sedation onto inhalation sedation, and then hopefully one day just by talking to them, okay? So that's the mission. It's not always about one tick, everybody gets IV sedation. That's not the way to do it. Well said, and I love that. That's really good. An individualized approach, and I like a bit like endodontists. They always tell me, "Oh, preventive endodontics. Yeah. We we want to do popotomies. We want to preserve the pop. You guys, you want to yeah get them off the sedation, which is very admirable and very good. I like that very much." Before we talk about the new drug and then how we can learn more, and actually for those whose interest has been piqued by learning, wanting to learn sedation, which I think is such a great thing to offer. Any other yeah. key points that you think GDPs, wet finger GDPs out there right now should know about? sedation and our patient base and how either something um, scientific you want to share uh, or a top tip okay so, so i would all say that i think any new patient that comes to me we get a proper sort of pre-questionnaire profile a good assessment and then decide what anxiety levels they might have okay i think the advancement in, in sedation will probably be on the monitoring so for me, for the last 10 years, I've sort of always looked at those advances. And most at sedation now, we use a pulse oximetry. We check the blood, we check the blood pressure. I've always wanted a bit more than that. So I have an entitled carbon dioxide monitoring as well, which is side stream monitoring, which is on the nasal. And that can assess the ventilation of a patient. Because in primary care, you're not in a hospital setting and it gives you a little bit more confidence of safety. I'm all about safety and the safety aspect of sedation. If I was saying to somebody starting out in IV sedation, like, is that something you really want to do? Because it's not suitable for every practitioner. It, has, it depends on your mindset as well. And is it something, because you will attract certain patients that will be challenging mm -hmm. and difficult. So I think like, we are very like Mike Gow. I look at the whole patient. Is this patient suitable to sedation? Okay. It's not just, it's not just a tick box uh, mentality. Okay. So uh, it's very important to use good language. I think hypnotherapy really, really helped me in my career. And that's just using some words and relaxing the patient. And I've been on some courses for 
just to help with that, to use the right language and, and speak to uh, psychologists and hypnotherapists. And because as we know, dentistry is, you know, there are very lots of uh, anxious patients out there, about 50%. And to those patients that are going to need maybe inhalation or IV or oral sedation. So it, it's finding out really going back to basics from what the patient is. What really struck a chord with me there, Roy, is be careful of what kind of patients you would attract and make it a considered yeah. thing for you. So I don't actually advertise directly to patients that I treat TMD. Yeah. I quite like doing that. But if I advertise, yeah. I know that yeah. my diary would be booked up six months. I still get people driving hundreds of miles to see me, which is a, you know, a great, a, you know, very flattering. I'm very happy to help them. I loved this field, but I still yeah. want to get rubber dam on. I still want to do my restorative dentistry. So I don't advertise. Yeah. But if you invest in a skill like sedation and you want to go in to be able to offer that to your patients, then if the work gets out and then you start seeing more challenging cases then yeah you have to be kind of prepared for that as well so i think that's an excellent point that, that i can definitely relate to so, roy so, yes so please would, so i would say you know a good mentor once said to me many years ago you know if you're about to sedate a patient always expect the unexpected okay mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it's like going on stage you never know what the audience is going to be like do you so you've got to be ready and you've got to have a team of people ready and what's my plan b what's my plan b if the sedation is a failure or I didn't complete the treatment, what am I going to do? So you need to think ahead a bit and say, right, okay, mm -hmm. my plan B is I've got some colleagues that can come and help me who have do advanced sedation. So that's my plan B, if plan A, which is a simple plan fails. Mm -hmm. So I'm just always one step ahead and I'm thinking, okay, this patient may be challenging, but I'm surprised we get through it with just basic safe sedation. Everybody's happy. But I can let you in a statistic, about 4% of my cases end up being sort of a dance sedation where I'm having to use different team members or different drugs. Or So 96% of the time, we're following straightforward techniques in most of my career in 34 years. Okay. Excellent. <clears throat> I'm thinking of two, I mean, based on our chat now, I really enjoy this by the way, Roy, two qualities, I think yeah. then, just what I've interpreted, this is my artistic interpretation of what you're saying. Two good qualities yeah. that a sedation operator or someone who wants to start doing sedation should have is A, emotional intelligence or stroke, a good communicator, and B, is leadership skills, Roy, because you've got, you got to be yeah. quick to think on your feet and you're managing and you're leading a yeah. team and you need to instill confidence in your team when you're doing this. Okay. Any other attributes yeah. or anything you want to add to that? So, so I would say, well, let me tell you a story. A practitioner rang me up a few weeks ago and said, look, I'm interested in starting it in my private practice. I've converted to private practice. I really don't want to refer the patients out. I've thought about sedation. I'm not sure whether it's for me or not. Okay, so I said, okay, so what we'll do is I will come to the practice, I'll show you the systems, we'll do the management, we'll give you the leadership, but here's the thing, why don't you bring in a dedicated sedationist who you're comfortable with and you can interview them, that they fit in with your practice and that in your ethos, but why don't you sit in with those cases and watch the dedicated sedationist do that and then get a feel for it and see if it's for you? Because all, all this guy ever had was some just experience as an undergraduate, you know, he don't, he's only done about 10, 10 cases from over the last 10 years. So, and those cases might be challenging. Why not experience that before you commit a lot of time and energy to a course that what we don't want to do, like in dentistry, and I've done it myself, you'll go down into a course, uh, you'll go off left center and you'll think, I must do that and then end up maybe not using that. I and hate I that so much, that. Roy. And what this podcast has become <laughs> is a constant reminder to implement and therefore be very careful about your next educational move. Yeah. Do the education. It's amazing yeah. for fulfillment from your career. But be have that mindset yeah. that you're going to go all in. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so you need to sort of pace it, really. I would get somebody in. Um, but is this going to work in my practice? Is this for me? But it's quite a commitment for a principal to do that. Well said. And that new drug, before we talk about how you can learn from you, just tell us about that yeah. new drug. How new are we talking? Is this something that's been around in other countries and now just been introduced to the UK? Or and tell us more about it. Okay. Yeah, so, so this is a, a benzodiazepine, very similar to midazolam that we've used for 40 years. But to me, it's a bit of a game changer. So I am quite excited about this new development. It was patented in about 2020, and it's been authorized in the UK, 2021. I'm using this drug now. I'm still using midazolam, but this drug is called Remy, Remy-Mazolam, okay? 
not to be confused with an anesthetist drug called Remy Fentanyl. That's a completely different drug, okay? So this is Remy Mazalam. Took me a while to learn to say. Who comes up with these names? Just pick something more <laughs> catchy, you know? Ah, <laughs> so the trade name is by favor, B Y F A V O. And so, so why do I think this is useful? Why do I think this drug is useful? Okay. So this, the onset and offset of this drug, so how quickly it comes on board and how quickly it wears off is much faster than midazolam. So this enables us to have a quicker induction for the patient. The patient will sedate more quickly. So we'll then be putting the local in much more quickly. But the thing that we have to watch is that the drug then profile is offset is much quicker. For example, after about eight minutes or 10 minutes of me giving the last increment of this drug, the patient will be up and about recovered, uh, walking, safe discharge. Okay. And why is that good? Because in my experience over the years, some cases of midazolam, the patients have been quite groggy. The discharge has taken a while. We've had to book a full hour to make sure that the patient recovers well. So we might have finished a straightforward extraction, say, that took me 10 minutes, but we've had to make sure with the drug profile that the patient was safe to leave for an hour. So with this drug, I can, if it's a straightforward procedure, I can be done and I can be inducted, treated and finished within, say, 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And a safe, safe patient leaving the uh, premises in a safe way. OK, they still need an escort, still need a chaperone. I like I term it as a soft drug, a clean drug. Its profile to me is really exciting because compared to, say, midazolam, where I'll have the occasional patient who will have a aggressive, idiosyncratic, odd reaction to the midazolam. And I'm sure people out there may have had that in their careers. We don't tend to get that with this drug. It seems to be metabolized slightly differently. And also with obese patients who are overweight and sleep apnea, they worry me when we have to do sedation. So this we seem to get better outcomes with. So all in all, I'm about the safety. I'm about safety. So I like the safety aspects of this drug. I like the pharmacology of this drug. So it's going to be in my repertoire, definitely. Yeah. Is this the future of sedation? I think it is going to be one of the mainstays. I don't think midazolam is going to disappear. I don't think some of the anesthetic drugs are going to disappear like propofol. That's all going to be there. But isn't it nice for a dentist to be able to go, ah, well, for this case, we're going to choose, we're going to use that because we know it's safer. We've got an elderly patient in. We don't want it to be confused at the end of the sedation because that's quite frightening for them. Whereas with this drug, within eight minutes, 10 minutes, it's like clear-headed, recovery, good discharge. So I think it's uh, certainly... A, I wish I'd have had it 25 years ago, I think. Well, it sounds very drug. promising. Roy, thank you so much for yeah. this really educational episode. Please tell us, for those who, who may be interested in learning more, they're implementing sedation into their practice. You've been doing teaching for years. How yeah. can we learn from you? Which association are you attached to? How can we find out more? Okay, so I'm attached with uh, two associations. One is my own web training site, which is mellowdental.co.uk, and you can find me on there. But I'm also a senior clinical advisor to UK Sedation. And we're doing webinars and presentations. So if you go on to UKSedation.com uh, and we'll be presenting at the Royal Society of Medicine on the 15th of February next on the new drug that we just talked about. So you can come and learn about that and be excited about that. Please send me the links, Roy, and I can put them in the show notes so people can yeah, jump on sure. to learn yeah, more. Right. And guys, even if you don't, even if you decide it's not for you, but someone in the practice may benefit, please send them this episode. But equally, I'm yep. sure you gain something of value in terms of maybe you had this misconception about sedation or, or one of those myths that we busted. So I, it certainly helped me. Roy, I love your Good. clear, calm communication style. Thank you so much. Thank you. And thank you for inviting me. Well, there we have it, guys. Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end because you have listened and watched. If you're on the app, you get 45 minutes or 0.75 hours of CPD credit. So now that you've got this far, why not answer a few simple questions to validate your learning, to ingrain your learning, but also to get a certificate that my team will send out to you. And that's on the app. If you haven't already downloaded the app, it's on iOS and Android. It's a free app. If you want to uh, rinse it for all the free stuff on there, go for it. Be my guest. But if you want to gain CPD and get exclusive content, become a Protrusive Premium member. 
I would love to have you as part of my community. Otherwise, you know how much I love connecting with you guys on Instagram. So if you have any ideas for episodes or you just want to share some love, uh, it's at Protrusive Dental and I look forward to hearing from you. I'll catch you same time, same place next week.